Hey there, in this video we're learning about calculus as it relates to volume. Let's take a look. The last several weeks we've talked about area quite a bit. The area of a region in general is the top function minus the bottom function integrated from a left to, uh, intersection or endpoint to a right endpoint. So the area of a region like this, just for some review, will be integrated from 0 to 8 of our top function, which is 4, minus our bottom function, which is 2x to the 1 3rd dx. We could then either do this by hand or use a calculator to integrate this, and we'll get a number, which represents the number of boxes that are filled in this space. Regions like this are going to be looked at in the view of volume, either as the base of a solid in three dimensions or as the basis of a revolution in three dimensions. So let's take a look at the first option first, which is when this green space, the region is the base of a solid, the bottom of a solid. So to do this, it's nice to consider the xy plane being tipped over on its side so that we have kind of a top three quarters view. So imagine the same green region being something like this. I'm much better at drawing these with paper pencil, but I'll have to do this for now. So you can kind of imagine, like I said, a top three quarters view down onto the uh, onto the plane here. So this region here would have something like a vertical segment in two dimensions manifesting this way in three dimensions. And the length of this, as we'll see, is critical to finding the volumes of each one of these. And what we'll see is that depending on the nature of the cross section, which is to say there's a third dimension that is invisible in the 2D view that juts out of the screen basically into the third dimension, um, the shape of that third dimensional slice is going to dictate the shape of the overall solid as well as the volume of that solid. So for example, imagine you knew that every one of these slices, these cross sections, were isosceles triangles, isosceles right triangles to be precise. So that means that each one of these triangles would be based on that length in two dimensions. So the purple triangle is smaller, the blue triangle is a little bit bigger, the pink triangle is the biggest because they're all you know in this invention, an isosceles triangle. And if you had enough of these triangles, you could add their areas all together and get the overall volume. So the last part there was subtle but important. Add together or integrate the areas to find the volume. We're going up one dimension here from area to volume. Uh, that's it. So that's if they're triangles. That's kind of what it would look like. Uh, imagine, you know, hypothetically, that maybe each cross section is not a triangle but a semicircle. Then you would have sort of these little bumps here. Again, based on the length of that segment in two dimensions, you would get some kind of slice or cross section in three dimensions. And you can imagine sort of a smooth object with infinitely many of these little cross sectional slices. So that's when the Green region is the base of a solid. I also mentioned that we can also look at volume when a region like this is the basis of a solid formed by revolution or revolving. So looking back at the two-dimensional view, just basically copying the image on the left-hand side there, one could imagine this space in green spinning around some kind of axis. So imagine you have this orange line with some kind of axis, and if you spin this green region around this axis, you would kind of end up with sort of on the outside, like a flat cylindrical type shape, because of the way that that object revolves around that orange axis. And the inside would sort of be hollowed out. You'd have this hole at the end here and a bigger hole out here. So imagine that the top boundary was red, then you'd sort of have a red exterior here as that flat line gets revolved around. And on the bottom, let's say this bottom curve was blue, you'd have an inside blue portion sort of as the interior of our object that's been hollowed out or cored out. So finding the volume of this, as well as finding the volume of something previous, is going to be uh, a calculus topic that we'll, that we'll cover. Both of these methods require you to recognize the length of something like this is found by top boundary minus bottom boundary. Top boundary minus bottom boundary. How that length gets used will vary depending on the kind of volume and the kind of shape we're using, but in general, a two-dimensional length like this 
is going to be top minus bottom, which you'll then manipulate as needed to come up with your appropriate volumes. So let's say we have this particular region, and we'll look at a visualization to, to help us make this concrete, with the top function being 4 and the bottom function being 2x to the 1 third. Uh, suppose that this is the base of such a solid, such that each cross section perpendicular to the x axis is some kind of shape. And in general, like I mentioned, this shape will be specified. Maybe it's a triangle, maybe it's a half circle, whatever it might be, some kind of shape. Find the volume of such a solid. So my drawings hopefully gave you some intuition as to what that might look like. Let me show you a better visualization. So here's the same exact space rendered in the software here. This is sort of a somewhat crooked, uh, because I forgot to reset it, uh, top-down view of the exact same plane. But as mentioned, we can imagine this in three dimensions. So the vertical axis here is a z-axis, which we cannot see in this particular view. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, horizontal segment there in yellow on the left-hand side, the purple bar there, they're calling this the base. I call it the bar, but same deal. That base is going to be rendered in three dimensions over here on the right-hand side. And let's say that each cross-section perpendicular to the x-axis is a square. Then as x varies, so does the size of the square, because base and height have to be equal. Maybe it's going to be a rectangle with some kind of height ratio. Maybe the height is twice as big as the, as the base, for example, or maybe it's 1.5 times bigger. And you're going to have different size rectangles for each cross-sectional slice. Let's go back to square. Well, to find the volume of the object, you don't need a single slice, you need all of them. So if you take the area of this, and 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 you add them all together, which is to say you integrate them, you will have the volume of the solid. Now we're looking at nine uh, squares here, nine cross sections, which is not a very good estimate, obviously. But an integral will take an infinite number of estimates, or infinite sum of, uh, of areas, and thus we can find the actual volume. So this stops at 31, but you can imagine having infinitely many slices to get a smooth object. So there we see uh, rectangular slices, uh, a different shape, but of course have a different mathematical approach, and likewise a different volume. So with semicircular slices, we would look at something like this. I think I can make n bigger, but I can fill off the screen here. So finding the area of each one of those cross sections and then integrating them to find the total sum is the name of the game for problems like these. The kind of shape differs as well as the volume that you can calculate. So how do you actually calculate the volume now that hopefully we have a better view of the visualization? The volume is calculated using this approach. This is volume by cross section. First, express the length of a vertical segment in the plane as top minus bottom. So come up with an explicit algebraic representation of what top minus bottom is. Then in step two, and this is a critical step here, express that uh, express the area of a single cross section based on that vertical segment or bar. So coming up with an explicit area function of x is what you do in step two. So come up with an explicit area function. And then step three is simply integrate that area function with respect to x from a to b, as usual, and you will find your volume. As I mentioned, we will do concrete examples during uh, our Zoom class. So here is just sort of the background knowledge you'll need for that Zoom class. So come up with the area of a single cross section using top minus bottom and some geometry knowledge, and then integrate the area function you come up with. Some formulas you'll need to know to make the second step possible include the following. So make sure you know that the area of a triangle is half base times height. The area of a rectangle is just base times height, and there's no one half involved. The area of a square, well, a square is a type of rectangle, and the square base and height are the same, so it just be base squared. And the area of a semicircle has somewhat unusual of a formula. You probably haven't seen this before, but it's best thought of as pi over 8 times diameter squared. That comes from the idea that it's one half pi r squared. It's half a circle. If you do a little math, you get pi over eight diameter squared. So base of a solid, basically find the 
integral of an area of a cross section. Now, for uh, the other perspective of volume, we looked at uh, how you can also revolve a region around some kind of axis. So suppose we were revolving this green space around the x-axis, it says, revolve this around the x-axis. So the axis of revolution here would be this. And my hope is that you can already visualize the object that will come out from revolving would look something like a solid cone of sorts, not exactly a cone, but kind of conical shaped. That would be entirely solid. So finding the volume of this thing is something we can do calculus, uh, or we can do using calculus. Uh, so how do we do this? One way to do this is to recognize that each one of those slices that we do to consider the area of a region like this, so going back to the Riemann definition of integral, these are the rectangles. Well, when you revolve a rectangle in a three dimension or around a line into three dimensions, you end up with a cylindrical disk. So imagine I take that rectangle and I revolve it around, I end up with a cylinder. Here you can see the original rectangle and then the cylinder that it creates. Well, with enough thin cylinders added together, I will have the volume of the entire object. And that's basically what we're going to do, is to find the area of one cylinder, or sorry, the volume of one cylinder, and then add them all together using an integral. Of course, you want to remember the volume of a cylinder formula, because you can't do the calculus version without knowing the geometry version. It's actually better to think about this for our perspective from this view. Imagine sort of a, a cylinder on its side, which I couldn't find a clear picture for. So I'll just try to draw one here. So here, the radius would be this length. And the quote unquote height, which is no longer vertical now, that would be this guy right here. So the volume formula for a cylinder, you hopefully remember, is pi r squared times height. Pi r squared h is the volume of a single cylinder. Uh, a little bit better than, than my, my drawings again. So here we have a function uh, e to the x, and we have some rectangles going from 0 to 2 in two dimensions on the left-hand side. And then it's going to be three dimensions on the right-hand side. So as I mentioned, as you rotate a, we'll first just show you this the height and radius here. Uh, as you rotate a rectangle around the an axis, it ends up being a cylinder. So if you look carefully at the path on the right hand side there, you can see those tracing out a cylinder. Let me make it more concrete. You can now see those cylinders. And those rectangles trace them out. So all we have to do, I don't know why it's not rendering the entire cylinder for some reason. There we go. All we have to do is to increase the number of those to get a better and better, better estimate for the exact volume. And now my computer is starting to overload. But you get the idea, hopefully. That so from that view, we have the following procedure for finding the volume by revolution. This is called the disk method. First, determine the length of the radius itself. That's going to be top minus bottom. The bottom is often the x-axis, which means top minus 0, because y equals 0 is the x-axis, but not always. But in general, top minus bottom. So find the radius, uh, which is going to be the rectangle height. So the height of this rectangle becomes the radius of the disk. Step two, find the volume of a representative disk. So a representative disk would be if you take this one little guy and revolve him around, the volume of this guy would be pi times the radius, which we found in step one, squared times the height. And from this perspective, the height of the rectangle, which again is horizontal, which is a little confusing, is going to be the width. And that width is a thin dx dimension. So pi r squared dx, or delta x at first, is going to be our single cylinder volume, pi r squared delta x. All we then is to integrate, do then is to integrate, and get pi radius squared dx. And again, we do that from a to b, numbers that we'll find. 
So this is the formula for volume by disk. It's basically the cylinder volume integrated. So the previous problem, you can see here, makes a solid with an approximation and an exact value when you do an integral. Not all objects that we can consider have to necessarily be solid. Some of ours can be hollowed out as well. So when the axis of revolution is not adjacent to a region, when it's separate from a region, for example, if I were to revolve this region here on the left-hand side around this red line, notice that there's a gap in between these functions right here, right? So because of that gap, you end up getting a hollowed out, you end up getting a hollowed out cross section. So imagine if I take a cross sectional slice here and then look at it flat, you would end up with not a disc, but a washer or a donut, if you like. Sort of a, a circle with a circle cut out of it in the center. So we have two circles to consider. What you also have to consider is the area of the shaded region here. The area of the shaded region is pi big R squared, the outer radius, minus the hollowed out portion, which is pi little r, or inner radius squared. So that would be the area of this red section right here. The area of that part is pi outer radius squared minus pi inner radius squared. Well, to turn that into a cylinder, it just means multiply by the thickness, which we were calling height earlier, and then height thickness is delta x. So that's the area of a single, or sorry, the volume of a single washer. All we do then is to integrate and change this to dx, and we can now find the volume of the overall object. It's not quite as cut and dry as this, though. Specifically, you find the volume by washer this way. You first calculate the outer and inner radii, big R and little r as mentioned, as we usually call them. And what defines the outer and what defines the inner is always relative to an axis. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say we had the following curves, purple and blue. If we're revolving the region between them, if I'm revolving this green region around the red line, then the outer function is the blue curve, and the inner function is the purple curve. Outer and inner is a term we define relative to the axis of rotation. So if I revolve around that red axis, you're going to get an outer blue and an inner purple. By contrast, if I revolve this very same region around, let's say, this orange axis instead, so if I'm revolving around this orange axis, then suddenly the purple is the outer function and the blue is the inner function. So the outer radius from this perspective, the outer radius would be the purple function minus the orange function, top minus bottom. And the inner radius would be the blue function minus the orange function. Because you have to factor in the axis itself in terms of finding its volume. So top minus bottom is still your paradigm, but not necessarily to define outer and inner. And this is something we'll see more of in class. We then use the formula we developed on the previous slide, pi outer radius squared minus pi inner radius squared, and then we integrate to find the volume. Let's look at the visualization of the washer method. This hopefully will make an earlier discussion a little more concrete for you. So we have a region here in yellow with an outer radius and an inner radius. In this case, the outer radius is defined by the, uh, you know, our, our axis of revolution is the x-axis here, sorry. Um, and our, our outer radius is defined by the line and the inner radius is defined by the curve. So that when we revolve the object around, we look at this in three dimensions, you can see how that would manifest. That's for a single rectangle or washer. You can see that here. Notice how the thickness changes of that portion because the thickness of this yellow region also changes as we vary our x value. It's thickest here, it's much thinner here. So let's take a look at the accumulation of all of these. We'd end up with something like this. So if we can find the volume of any one of those and then add them all together by having infinitely many, we would end up with the exact volume as opposed to an approximation.
And that's what the interval does for us. Okay, that was a lot of information. Here's the big takeaway. If you could find the area, the area of a single cross section of an object, the face of it, then you integrate that to get the volume of the object. If you're revolving a space, as opposed to having a cross-sectional space, if you're revolving a space, if your axis is adjacent, it's just pi r squared dx. If your axis is not adjacent, then you have to subtract out the inner radius, which is what you're seeing here. So if you know these formulas and from geometry, you'll be in great shape for class later this week. All right, see you soon.